How we living, big dogs? Not as good as your man's, because it's 57 degrees out right now, and New Jersey has not sniffed 57 degrees in like three months. So starting to get a little depressed over here, man. Those winter blues are real, but guess what? We have a gorgeous video on tap for y'all today. My 2019 fantasy football top running back sleepers. So we went over my top wide receiver sleepers a couple weeks ago, which I'll link up there as well as down in the description. I highly recommend y'all check that out afterwards. Now I will insert the cliche line that everyone says about sleepers nowadays. These aren't guys that you don't know. As the rookies come into the league and as we learn a little bit more during the summer, I will start getting into videos where I talk about guys whose ADPs are at 100 or 150 and later. But these are guys that I see as very, very, very undervalued right now. And you can get them in like the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th round of your best ball drafts. So these are my top sleepers for 2019 fantasy football at the running back position. All right, the only thing I ask you guys before the video, if you do enjoy the video, if you find a lot of value information in it, a thumbs up down below would be very much appreciated. It lets me know that you all appreciate my work. If you're on the podcast listening, a subscribe and a rating and whatever a review would be beautiful. I don't care if it's one star. I don't care if it's five star. We'll take anything we can get at this point, right? And the first running back we're going to get into is Rashad Penny of the Seattle Seahawks. Now, ironically, Penny wasn't a guy that I loved coming out of college as much as some of y'all because I did a... Geis versus Penny comparison last year. Who would I want, obviously, prior to Geis's torn ACL? And I picked Geis, and everyone was yelling at me about it. Um, and Geis obviously got hurt, so we don't know how it would have worked out. But I'm pretty sure if Geis stayed healthy, he would have had a better fantasy year than Rashad Penny. But that's neither here nor here. nor here. Rashad Penny, though, was absolutely beloved by Pro Football Focus. PFF was touting him as, like, the greatest running back of all time in college. Coming out last year... And he was pretty solid for the Seahawks, at least when he was on the field, right? He only appeared in 12 games in his rookie year. He dealt with injuries um, on and off throughout the season, the preseason, and it cost him four games. Can't forget that he was a former first-round pick for the Seattle Seahawks, though. He carried the ball 85 times for 419 rushing yards, 4.9 yards per carry. Now, that's a small sample size, and I hate to ring on yards per carry because, one, that's not a great measure of success. And two, uh, 85 carries is not a big enough sample size for me to really rely on for good analysis. However, the 4.9 yards per carry was top 12 amongst all running backs with at least 85 carries. His 3.5 yak yards after contact was the fifth best rate among all running backs with that same sample size or more. His fantasy points per snap were top 20 among running backs. Um, so I think at the very worst, we've established that Rashad Penny is a good, if not Pretty damn good NFL running back caliber, right? The big elephant in the room here, however, is Chris Carson. He was a fucking, he was an elephant last year. He was a monster. He was a beast. He had an impressive rookie year in preseason and then four games into the season. Then, of course, he suffered his major leg injury and he missed the rest of the year. But he outright won the starting job during the summer last year. And all the beat reports said it and all the coaches were talking about it. And no one wanted to believe it because Rashad Penny was a first round pick. Carson was a seventh round pick. But he played his way into the starting role. He didn't look back. He went for over 1,300 yards from scrimmage, nine touchdowns in 2018. He won the starting job, and it was his for the entire year. I love Chris Carson. I really do. I always have, and I always will. But we're talking about fantasy football here, people. Carson is the prime example of those running backs that get picked in the early to mid rounds that don't catch passes and disappoint. Looking at this chart, y'all, this is the running backs 16 to 32. These are all of the guys that were picked in the early to mid rounds of 2018 fantasy football drafts. Look at the names. Drake, Collins, Henry, Ajayi, Freeman, Lamar Miller, Ingram, Deion Lewis, Marshawn Lynch, McKinnon, Burkhead, Coleman, Hyde is a list of guys who don't catch passes or were not given the workload. For the most part, it was guys that didn't catch passes. The bust rate was super, 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 super high because they don't operate on three downs. It's very difficult to succeed as a fantasy running back in consecutive years if you're not involved on third downs. And I have a really good study that I'm going to get into in a second um, proving that. You know, of course it happens, though. There are going to be guys that perform well in fantasy if they don't catch passes. Um, and it happened here with Chris Carson. We've seen it with Jordan Howard. 
The thing is, the earlier the pick, the earlier you have to pick him, the higher the risk rate. And when you have a guy like Penny who's going later, the later he goes in drafts, the more the value is there, in my humble-ass opinion. Now, the way to spot running back breakouts or running back sleepers is by identifying good offenses that run the ball a lot with ambiguous backfields. No one has full control over the backfield. And uh, the the starting job can be taken. It might take a little bit of a time. It might take some time, but it is absolutely capable of happening. Now, the second and third running backs in those depth charts are probably the ones who end up winning the job or breaking out or being sleepers because you don't expect them, obviously, because that's why you pick them second or third and not first. Now, Carson's price tag is actually not crazy right now. Um, he's currently being picked as running back 24, pick 49 overall. I forgot to say Rashad Penny's ADP. He's going around pick 70, 70-ish, I think, right now, uh, running back 30 off the board. So you're getting him about 25 spots later than Chris Carson, but I would much rather take him three rounds later, right, and grab a guy like Cooper Cup or OJ Howard or Tariq Cohen in that middle round than use it on a guy like Carson who does not catch passes. So the study that I was talking about. Why are we so afraid of Carson? Because of his pass catching. Now, I dug deep on this one, right? I'm bringing you all the big facts as I always do. Tuck your shirts in, stop yelling, get your popcorn, and listen up, please. I'm going to break down these numbers. I got to kind of read my notes. There's a lot of numbers here. Carson finished with 20 receptions last year. A whopping 20, okay? 10 fantasy points. Be- beautiful. Despite playing on 481 offensive snaps. So I wanted to see, since you know I'm claiming it's hard to produce year over year without catching a lot of passes, is that true? I looked at the last 10 years of running backs. I exported every running back over the last 10 years using Rotoviz's screener. It's a great app, great free app. Just go on Google, type in Rotoviz screener, and you'll be able to do something like this. And I wanted to have a cutoff, right? Because I don't just want to include any running back. I wanted to include just good running backs, right? And see what they did the following year. So what I did was put a threshold at 165 half PPR fantasy points for the running back. Because on average, over the last 10 years, the running back 20 scored 165 half-point PPR fantasy points. So we exported every running back from the last 10 years and then cut it at 165 fantasy points or more. And that narrowed it down to 202 running backs over the last 10 years. So as I said, Carson caught 20 passes. So I narrowed it down to running backs that fit that 165-point criteria and caught 20 or fewer passes. That narrowed it down to 26 running backs. Of the 26, six of them happened in 2018, so we don't have next year data, of course, so that narrows it down to 20 running backs. So we have a sample of 20 running backs over the last 10 years that finished as a top 20 running back while catching 20 or fewer passes. I wanted to see what they did in the following year. So of the 20, 15 of them had fewer fantasy points the following year, 15 of 20, on average, 81 fewer fantasy points literally cut in half. Their production was cut in half. There were five guys who were able to increase their fantasy production in the following year. That was LaDainian Tomlinson. That was Michael Turner in 2011, Adrian Peterson and Frank Gore in 2012, Cedric Benson in 2010. None of them happened in the last five years. As this NFL is moving towards more of a passing league and we're seeing the running backs get more and more involved in the passing game. It's even harder for these types of running backs to replicate. As we've seen over the last five years, none of them came from that span. This is not a good look for Carson. Penny is the perfect candidate for a second year breakout given his size, speed, and pedigree. He was a monster producer in college. He has a workhorse size, 5'11", 220, as you can see, a 92nd percentile weight adjusted speed score. He ran a 4.46 at 220 pounds. He had a 76th percentile college target share, so we know he can do well in the passing game. Last year, Carson caught, like I said, 20 passes on 481 snaps. Penny caught nine passes, so just about half, but on 300 fewer snaps than Carson played on. Mike Davis, J.D. McKissick, and Trey Madden combined to have more than double the amount of receptions that Carson had. So realistically, they were the third down back in this offense. Carson did not play on passing downs. All three of them are free agents this summer. Mike Davis already signed with Chicago, but the other two are going to be gone. Head coach Pete Carroll already came out and said he wants to use this duo, Carson and Penny, as a one-two punch in the league. They are already the most run-heavy offense in the NFL. They ran the ball 33 times a game last year, and they're going to continue to do that as long as their OC stays intact, which he is not leaving anytime soon in Schottenheimer. So 33 carries a game, even if Carson gets 18 
that still leaves room for, for Penny to get 10 to 12 carries along with most of the passing work. I really believe that he's going to get most of the passing work in this offense with all those guys gone. And Chris Carson shown the lack of receiving ability. So he can get 10 to 12 carries plus, you know, four or five targets a game. That's going to make him a candidate for 15 plus touches. If they really do use this as a one-two punch, you know, a 50-50 snap share, Rashad Penny's going to be able to compete for the job. Remember, he was a first round pick. They're going to give him every opportunity to compete with Chris Carson. And Carson's not a guy that necessarily stays healthy all the time. He missed 12 games, obviously, in his rookie year with the leg break. And he missed multiple games last year. So both of his NFL seasons, he missed multiple games. Um, so he's not a lot to stay on the field. If Rashad Penny can really get that 50-50 snap split, there's no reason why he cannot push for the starting job. If he gets it, he's good enough to stay on the field and absolutely run away with the job. So I love Penny as the less expensive running back in Seattle's backfield. So that brings us to number two. And again, guys, if you enjoyed, if, if you're getting some value, some good information, the big facts that you ain't finding elsewhere, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you drop a comment below. I want to know what your thoughts on Rashad Penny versus Chris Carson are. I know a lot of you guys are going to be like, ah, Chris Carson's a beast. There's no way he loses the job. But I think I laid out a pretty good argument for why that may be the case, or at least why the fantasy gap between the two can be a lot closer than a lot of people imagine because there's such a run heavy backfield. But we're going to move over to number two. And that is Royce Freeman of the Denver Broncos. A lot of the stats that I have in here, I had already tweeted out, right? So if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you do that. Nick underscore B D G E. Tweeting out a lot of things that I'm not going to be putting on YouTube. So that's a different way to get some fancy football goodness. Now, Freeman is in a similar situation to Rashad Penny uh, with a little less draft stock. He was a third round pick last year. Whereas Rashad Penny was obviously a first round pick. Carson was a seventh round pick. Philip Lindsay was an undrafted free agent, but he still earned the bigger half of this backfield. Freeman shares a lot of the same physical traits as Penny as well. He's got the workhorse size, six foot, 229 pounds. Player profiler has best comparable is Steven Jackson. Very high college dominator rating, 68th, 68th percentile. College target share was in the 61st percentile. And he ran really well for a guy his size. A 4 5 4 40 at 230 pounds puts him in the 86th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. Just like Penny, Freeman's counterpart is going early, early, early in drafts. And he's a ridiculous value much later on, in my opinion. Lindsey is currently the 16th running back off the board right now, according to draft, in the mid-30s, which makes him even riskier. Freeman is running back 36, around pick 90, which is a stupid gap. I know it's going to eventually close throughout the offseason as people watch videos like this and hear Roto World go nuts about Freeman and whatnot. But I, I don't think people realize this because Lindsey is, first of all, because he was so good at running the ball. Second of all, because he's smaller. So you kind of assume he's a scat back and he catches a lot of, a lot of passes, but Lindsey only caught 35 passes on the year, which were the lowest, lowest total in terms of running back catches per game, receptions per game of any of the top 12 fantasy running backs last year. So he was the least receiving type back of the top 12 fantasy finishers last year. And like I said, it, you, you didn't really realize it because you look at Lindsay and you assume these small guys, the way they get on the field is because they're so good at catching the ball. However, Lindsay, that was not the case. Now there's three val variables I'm, I'm looking at here when it comes to Lindsay, right? I don't only like to tout the guys like the Rashad Pennies and Royce Freemans. I need to make sure that I back up. I need to play devil's advocate on myself and tell you why Philip Lindsay won't, you know, he break out even more than he did in his rookie year. I'm looking at Three things here. Lindsay's season-ending injury, right? The completely new coaching staff and Lindsay's play down the stretch of last year. Prior to what was called a, a possible scaphoid fracture along with lig ligament damage, that was the injury that Lindsay, I guess, suffered um, that shortened his ridiculously good rookie campaign. Listen, I love Lindsay. I owned him in like half of my redraft leagues last year, so I'm a big fan of Lindsay. Um, but Lindsey was brutal over the final few games for the Broncos. In weeks 14, 15, and 16, he carried the ball a total of 38 times for 100 yards, which is 2.6 yards per carry. His yards per reception over that span was just 5.2. And I, I do hate taking small sample sizes, but I think it's I think it's worth wondering that after the full wear and tear of the season, if at the end he started to slow down a little bit. He is 5'7 and 184 pounds, guys. He has a very, very small frame. Um, can he handle full workload over the full season? His play deteriorated and then he eventually got hurt. Freeman exploded in the preseason last year, right? And everyone pretty much pronounced him a league winner. That was it. He was so good. He scored some touchdowns and then, uh, and he was going to be an RB1 in fantasy, but he disappointed big time in the regular season. He led the, the preseason with three rushing touchdowns of all running backs. He led the entire NFL. 
He only upped that number to five in 14 regular season appearances. I do think it's very, very much worth noting, though, in Week 17, without Lindsey, Devontae Booker was still there, but this was without Lindsey. Freeman had 25 touches. He got 25 touches, including eight catches on 10 targets. Shows you he can catch the ball out of the backfield as well. Went over 100 yards from scrimmage. So if you forgot about football, if you forgot about fantasy football in Week 17, because no one plays at that point, Royce Freeman... Got 25 touches in that last game without Philip Lindsay. Um, Devontae Booker is signed through 2019. He's only a $95,000 cap hit. That's an unheard of number in the NFL, right? $95,000. They, they literally wipe their ass with that, that amount of money. He's a $95,000 cap hit if they release him, which wouldn't surprise me since it is a whole new coaching staff and a whole new system going on, and, and he sucks. So that also wouldn't surprise me. But we need to look at the big facts here, guys, and these are them. This is a chart that I tweeted out a few weeks ago, and I said, are we sure that Philip Lindsay is actually the better running back here? When you look at the efficiency numbers from both Pro Football Focus and Player Profile, Profiler, it's actually not even close. Royce Freeman wins across the board. Yards after contact per attempt, evaded tackles, evaded tackles per attempt, in elusive rating, in juke rate, in yards created per carry, all in the NFL ranks as well. Freeman dominated Lindsay in all of those numbers. The only thing that Philip Lindsay won was run blocking efficiency. And that has absolutely nothing to do with running backs. That is completely exclusive. That is all on the offensive line. He was third in the NFL with the third best run blocking efficiency of any running back. Royce Freeman was 33rd. And that right there, my friends, is the difference of what broke right for Lindsay and what broke wrong for Freeman. Does that mean that Royce Freeman will get better blocking and Lindsay will get worse? No, it doesn't. But it probably means more likely that the two are on par in 2019 and that the numbers will skew more favorably to a, 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 an even split of how the run blocking happens in Denver. The other thing about Denver is they have a completely new coaching staff coming in, right? They hire Vic Fangio as their head coach, the former defensive coordinator for the Bears, who's a great defensive minded coach, but that's all he is. He doesn't do the offense. Rich Scangarello is the new offensive coordinator. He's a guy that's been working up his way into the league for a long, long time. And I, I did a little history research breakdown. And I also did a complete NFL coaching changes breakdown uh, a few weeks ago. So you could find that up there. You can find it linked down below as well. He worked his way through college jobs and he is an offensive minded head coach. And he has based his entire offense, the style around Kyle Shanahan and his zone run system. He had been under Shanahan as a QB coach for the last two years in San Francisco and was the offensive quality coach under Shani in Atlanta back in 2015. So he knows the offense very well. He has styled his offense completely around Kyle Shanahan's system, which is obviously a good thing. He's going to bring it to Denver. The more I read about it, the more I love this fit, especially, especially for Freeman, who will get to pick and choose his holes based on the running system. He has great vision, and based on his 84th percentile agility score, he has extremely, extremely, extremely quick feet to be able to follow his blockers and find the hole, which is big in these zone run schemes. He's not a power run guy that's that's going to run in a power system that picks one hole and explodes through it, whereas Lindsey has the burst. He's so fast. So he's a guy that if you're running the ball from under center, boom, he gets a couple steps to get going. If there's a hole right there where that's like how a, a, a power run system works, so you go to one hole, right? You pick one hole and you run right into it, no matter if there's a hole or not, if it's in between the A and B gap, whatever, that's perfect for a guy like Lindsay who has great bursts. But for a guy like the zone run scheme, that's way better for a guy like Freeman who can see the holes opening up and he gets to pick and choose his holes because he's agile and he has very quick feet. Um, so I'm not sure Lindsay's burst score is going to be everything for this offense. And the last part, of course, is Lindsay's injury, right? This is, uh, this is going to be a huge rehab for him, nearly six months, which places him back around June at full health. If, you know, give or take a month or so, depending on his rehab, if it goes well, if it goes really, I don't know, whatever, right? Six months is, is supposed to be the estimated time frame for his rehab. Their off season program starts in mid May. So there's a good chance that he's actually not there for the start of their offseason program, meaning Freeman will have a chance to impress the new coaching staff and have a chance to work his way back into a 50-50 split. I know how good Lindsey was, and he definitely deserves the starting role, and he deserves the bulk of carries here. But Freeman, don't get it twisted. Freeman was really, really good, as you saw by those efficiency metrics per PFF and player profiler. So Freeman has every right to get at least a, a, you know, a 40-60 split and work his way into a bigger role because he's someone that can play on all three downs. So I really like Freeman as a later pick 
in this backfield. All right, we're moving into the third running back on this list. He's the final running back that I'm going to break down with the big facts and get really in depth. I'll have some honorable mentions at the end of the video, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But talking about breaking down big facts in depth, if y'all think this video is good, if y'all think I'm doing good analysis on this, then you're going to want to cop the Big Dogs Gotta Eat 2019 Fantasy Football Draft Guide. I put together a draft kit for y'all every summer to help you prep for your draft and keep you updated throughout the summer. It is interactive on mobile tablet computer it's literally everything you're going to need for your fantasy football draft and it's on sale right now the pre-order price is 25 percent off before april 1st you're going to get not only the top sleepers at all of the positions quarterback running back wide receiver tight end you're getting the must own players the must draft guys you're getting my top busts all the breakout candidates you're getting my top 250 big board along with positional rankings by tier you're getting the big dogs got to eat bible it's an article i write like eight thousand words deep of every position and exactly how you should attack them in your 2019 fantasy football draft. I'm telling you, this guide goes in depth like nothing else out there on the market. Also do exclusive articles if you're interested in the fantasy football industry. I talk about that. Oh, my top 15 websites and resources to use for fantasy research. So if you can't find something in my draft guide, you will have a list of all the best websites right there that you can click on because it is interactive. There's links, there's videos inside this thing. Uh, it is the number one thing on the on the market right now to help you prep for your for your 2019 fantasy football season. It is updated throughout the entire summer. So rankings will go out probably in a few weeks and they will stay updated throughout the entire summer. So if you have your rookie drafts, your dynasty drafts, your season long drafts, if you're doing best ball, it's all updated throughout the entire summer, completely interactive. You can get it right on your phone. So make sure you cop that right now, bigdogsdraftguide.com. You're getting 25% off if you pre-order prior to April 1st. I love y'all. Let's talk about Jalen Samuels, Pittsburgh Steelers running back. Is James Conner the guy there in Pittsburgh right now? Definitely. But again, for now, is there room for another player in the backfield to produce? Definitely. Samuels is a pretty popular name at this point for fantasy football players because Yahoo's wild ass let you put him in either the tight end or the running back position when he was getting like 25 carries a game. It was absurd, but you know, he got a lot of buzz. So most people are pretty familiar with who Jalen Samuels is. Will that happen again this year? No, he, he's a running back. Um, he's currently the 93rd player off the board, running back 37 on draft.com. And on a site like Fantasy Football Calculator, I know like some people use that, but that's horrible, horrible ADPs right now. He's 167. The leagues on there are not paid leagues. So I would much more suggest them. That doesn't even fucking make sense. I would suggest at a much higher degree to go on draft.com if you're looking for rankings. I, I don't even think you need to sign up for account. I'm pretty sure you could just see the rankings there um, for or ADP. And those are paid leagues, so the ADP is much more realistic. And 93rd player off the board, running back 37 for Jalen Samuels. Samuels is really a jack-of-all-trades kind of guy. He is a weapon, to, to put it at really what he is. He's a bit too small to play tight end, but he's a bit too thick with multiple Cs to play wide receiver. And kind of big to play running back, but not too big. Six foot, 225 pounds. Very much like Royce Freeman, ran a 4, 5, 4, 40. Puts him in the 82nd percentile college um, our speed score, way to adjust the speed score. That's among NFL running backs, not college running backs. I apologize. He's got a good burst score over, over the 50th percentile, a very good agility score in the 70th percentile. But the main thing to point out here is the college target share of a 97th percentile. He is very good at catching passes. He is a passing down weapon. And if there's one thing the Steelers are going to need to replace Antonio Brown with, it's just that passing down weapons. Samuels played a total of 39 snaps through week 12 of last year, but with the Steelers battling injuries to James Conner, Samuels stepped up in a big way. He finished the year with 26 receptions on 29 targets. Those 26 receptions are more than Lamar Miller had, Mark Ingram had, Chris Carson had, Jordan Howard, AP, Marlon Mack, Derrick Henry, despite playing on 20.8% of the Steelers' plays. Get that through your thick ass skulls, people. Jalen Samuels is a phenomenal pass catcher. And if there's one facet of James Conner's game that could be improved, it's that. He is a grinder. He's a bully with the potential for highlight plays. He caught 55 passes, yes, but I'm not that impressed considering what a guy like Le'Veon Bell, right? Conner pretty much had the same snap share as a guy like Le'Veon Bell did when he was, when he was with Pittsburgh, but commanded a much lower target and reception number. So James Conner, yes, did catch 55 passes, which is a very good number. But considering 
what could have probably came out of that had like Jalen Samuels got more passing work is probably very understated. So yeah, 55 receptions on 71 targets, which is a 13% lower catch rate than Samuels had. He had four drops, which is seventh highest among all NFL running backs last year. And in those five games down the stretch, Samuels caught 22 of 23 targets, which obviously is a ridiculous pace. If you pace that out to 16 games, we're looking at 70 receptions. He's a great pass catcher in an offense that's losing 169 targets from Antonio Brown and another, I don't know how many Jesse James had last year, maybe like 40. But Samuels also has the size at six foot 225 to actually be a workhorse running back. Am I saying he's going to overtake Connor for the running work? No, absolutely not. But if it if it needs to happen, if Connor gets hurt because he has missed multiple games in both of his NFL seasons, then Samuels has every bit of the size to do so. And they're not afraid to use him as a workhorse because we saw that when Connor was out. In week 15 versus New England, Samuels touched the ball 21 times for 172 total yards last year, which was sandwiched between an 18 touch game and a 15 touch game. And the last game of the year, when Connor returned from his injury, Samuels operated as the passing down back. He caught seven of eight passes. And I think that's more likely the split we're going to see in 2019 than the beginning of the year when Connor was getting, you know, six to seven targets a game, because I just don't think he's that efficient in the passing game. The other really interesting note here is who Pittsburgh brought in on their coaching staff. They hired a guy named Eddie Faulkner to be their running backs coach. Prior to joining the Steelers, Faulkner spent six years from 2013 to 2018 at North Carolina State University as the school tight ends, fullbacks, special team coordinator. Take a guess where Jalen Samuels went to school and played running back slash tight end. North Carolina State University. Look at those reception totals. 65, 55, 75. 774 in terms of receiving touchdowns, 9, 6, 12 as a rusher. If there is anyone that knows how to use Jalen Samuels and will advocate for the use of Jalen Samuels on the field, it's literally this guy. I could you couldn't name a literally a better person on the planet than to pair with Jalen Samuels. And I think that's a big reason why they brought this guy in. With Samuels, I see a guy with a passing down role in an offense that uses their running backs in the passing game a ton on a team that is losing a lot of targets. He's a great pass catcher, but he's different. He's not like the other great pass catchers in the NFL, like the James Whites or the Gio Bernards or the Tyree Cohen. He's six foot 225. If something were to happen to James Conner, and like I said, he's now missed at least three games in both of his NFL seasons, Samuels has literally top 15, if not RB1 weekly upside. In my opinion, he's a great combination of ceiling floor that I would love to get in round nine, round 10, especially if you fade running backs early on. All right, so Jalen Samuels, that, that's my wrap on him, right? Here's the thing with breakout running backs, right? Or, or sleeper running backs. Um, it, it's more of a gamble. It's more of playing the odds and the analytics than it is like a confident feeling. Because any of the guys that are sleepers or breakout usually go into the season as the number twos or threes in the backfield. So you're playing the odds. You're playing the fact that maybe the guy ahead of him doesn't catch passes. So the other guy works his way onto the field. You're playing the fact that someone's injury prone. You're playing the fact that it's an ambiguous backfield and no one has established themselves, right? And I think that's a little bit different than wide receivers. With running backs, you need these things pretty much to break right. And I definitely won't guarantee that these guys have monster years, but they fit the exact criteria you're looking for in a mid to, mid to late round running back with huge upside. Size, speed, and backfields that they can take advantage of whether that's through injury, draft pedigree opportunity, or just a lack of real workhorse in that backfield. And those are the, exactly the guys you're looking for. And they may need to sit on your bench for a while, maybe even like a whole month or a month and a half. And you might not even need to draft them because they might not do anything for the first couple of weeks and then get dropped by their owner. But these are the guys that end up, you know, finishing inside the top 20 or sometimes the top 15 if you're lucky and help you make that playoff push because you didn't have to put a lot of draft capital pedigree into it. That is that is what I have for sleepers. We're about to get into honorable mentions. But again, y'all, if you think I'm breaking these guys down, I'm telling you, you're going to be blown away by the draft guide. So bigdogsdraftguide.com, make sure you cop that. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoy the video so far. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and to the podcast if you are new because we're breaking down shit like this. Every Tuesday, every Friday is a fantasy football breakdown um, going forward. And then in June, we are pushing out six videos a week. So you know your man's going to cover you everything 2019 fantasy football. So make sure you subscribe. So honorable mention, guys, I had on here. Actually, this list went to complete shit, to be honest. Damian Williams, he's definitely not going to be a sleeper anymore. Um, but with the signing of Carlos Hyde, I think it's a very good thing for Damian Williams. It wasn't so much in the sense of a sleeper, but he'll be undervalued. If he goes anywhere near like the third round now, I think he is an absolute smash button on uh, he's a smash cop 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 button um because he's he's clearly going to start the year as a workhorse and it's probably going to be very hard to lose that role in the kansas city offense 
Elijah McGuire was a guy I liked as a deeper pick, but they signed Le'Veon, so he's off the list. List. <laughs> Speaking of lisps, um, Kenneth Dixon, they signed Mark Ingram, so he's off the list for me. Naeem Hines is an interesting one. I didn't realize he had 81 targets last year in that offense. I love Marlon Mack, but I think Naeem Hines definitely warrants a lot of look in PPR leagues because of the, the high uh, reception total that he had and target total that he had. So Naeem Hines is an honorable mention guy for me. TJ Yeldon, I'm really excited to see where he lands. I hope he lands in like Philadelphia where it's a backfield he can get, you know, 10 to 15 touches a game. TJ Yeldon, free agent. Rod Smith, another free agent. So is Corey Grant. Yeldon, Smith, Grant are three guys I'm keeping a very keen eye on throughout free agency and hoping that they land in backfields that are open. So let me know down below, who are your, who are some of your favorite undervalued running backs right now or sleeper running backs right now? Uh, anything, any comments, concerns, questions, feedbacks, criticism? Don't come up in here with that shit. I'm just kidding. Drop that shit down below. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see y'all on Friday. I love you.